Внимание! Говорит штаб НПДО Корт. Граждане, объявляется воздушная тревога. Воздушная тревога. Воздушная тревога. If you feel frightened, disoriented, and with thoughts full of unanswered questions, don't worry. It's normal. This is how a citizen in the Soviet Union would have felt in the event of an enemy attack, having to take refuge without warning, in a hurry, in the underground bunker closest to their workplace or home. We are in Lithuania. We are in Vilnius, underground, in a Soviet anti-atomic bunker. This bunker has been kept as it was. Almost all the objects that are here are original from the time. In a bunker, almost all spaces are confined. Each guest would have had half a square meter, or a square of floor measuring 50 by 50 centimeters. You can still make out the lines drawn on the floor to show how much space a standing person had to occupy. Imagine what it would have been like to live with so little space available for three days without ever being able to see the sunlight. Luckily for us, this bunker still has its original drawing from which the measurements can be taken. The main room measures only 10 meters long by 6 meters wide. There are two doors, one connected directly to the factory above and an emergency one connected to the outside. Currently, only the emergency door is practicable, as the old main door, connected to the factory, has been bricked up and sealed. To enter the bunker, we use the secondary door, which is located immediately after the entrance corridor. To save living space, the beds are arranged in bunk structures, one on top of the other. The entrance corridor, which is connected to the outside, is specially designed to put any attackers at a disadvantage. The width of the corridor is sufficient to allow the passage of one person at a time, thus preventing the possible entry of a large number of enemies all at once. The stairs are divided by a curve that divides them into two small flights, making it difficult to carry bulky weapons. The entrance door to the bunker was deliberately designed behind a curve in the concrete wall. This was to avoid that, in the event of an attack with a grenade or a rocket launcher, the explosion and the consequent shock wave could burden the door itself, instead unleashing the destructive force directly on the front wall. The security door is made of steel and is about 20 centimeters thick,
To open the main door, a large rotary handle had to be turned. This operated the screw mechanism that moved the large metal wedge used to lock the door up or down. The doors of these bunkers are watertight, or at least they were at the time of their construction. However, there was a need for a forced ventilation system, a system that filtered the air from outside so that those inside the bunker could breathe clean air. Often the ventilation system was twofold. It was possible to operate the system by means of an electric motor, or if there was no electricity, it was possible to activate the ventilation system by hand by means of a special hand crank device that worked in exactly this way. One person would then have to stand by to operate the device so that the others could breathe clean, filtered air. In this bunker, the electrically operated ventilation system no longer worked, but the hand crank operated system remained fully functional. It should also be noted that in the bunkers, almost all systems are redundantly designed. There are at least two machines doing the same job, in this case, we can see that the bunker ventilation system is double. We have its systems where there is both an electric motor and a manual crank. As with the ventilation system, the electrical system is also redundant. There are two different lighting systems, a primary one, supplied by the mains, and an emergency one, supplied as needed by a generator. The main switches are also double, each for its own system. Even the electricity sockets are divided between the two systems, and each socket belonging to the main electrical system has its twin belonging to the auxiliary electrical system next to it. The generator, which powered the secondary electrical system, was placed on a special pedestal. From there, an electric cable carried electricity to the consumers. In this way, the bunker would have power constantly, even in the event that the public electricity network stopped working. Soviet-made firearms were also available in the bunker, as well as various items and tools for their maintenance. There are the most common items such as forks, knives, portable lamps, clothing, personal protective equipment. In a special area, there is a fire extinguisher, fire hose, buckets, and all the other tools needed to put out a fire.
This instrument was used to measure the air pressure inside the bunker. Being an emergency shelter, this structure is equipped with objects and apparatuses to facilitate survival and operations in the event of the presence of radioactivity or harmful gases. Various dosimeters, also called Geiger counters, are available in special cabinets. These are devices that can measure the level of radioactivity in objects, people, or the environment. There are other types of disposable dosimeters that consist of small metal tubes with a grid at one end. By looking inside the tube through a lens at one end, the degree of radioactivity can be observed on the graduated scale printed on the glass at the other end. An extensive supply of gas masks is still present in the bunker. There are masks with a separate filter and masks with a built-in filter. This is a special piece of kit that allows you to breathe independently even in the absence of oxygen, as oxygen is contained in this tank that is worn over the shoulder like a rucksack and flows directly into the mask. The oxygen tank has an autonomy of two hours. There are crates of new gas masks, still packed. If needed, these should suffice for all the bunker guests. Let's see what our view would look like if we wore one of these gas masks. A wide assortment of medicines for almost every need was available to the guests. Each person would be given a small plastic box called a personal pharmacy. This contains a set of medicines and an instruction booklet for taking them. If there was a nuclear emergency, everyone would also have iodine pills to swallow to counteract radiation poisoning. There are still the original garments of the time to protect against radiation. This was worn like this, over the jacket. One of the most curious items is this triangular briefcase. Can you imagine what it is? This is a baby swaddle. It could be used to protect the newborn from radiation, 
while at the same time allowing it to be changed, or in the opposite way, to protect those who would care for the newborn in case it emitted a harmful amount of radiation to other humans. There are two side-by-side -side bathrooms. Considering the small size of the bunker, the bathrooms are quite spacious and equipped with the necessary amenities. In addition to hand soap and toothpaste, one of the two bathrooms has an electric razor and a small mirror for the men to shave. Above the sink, there is a special container that allows one to wash hands even when there is insufficient water pressure. Water is poured into the container. By placing your hands underneath it and pressing upwards on a plastic trigger, some water escapes from the bottom of the container, spilling over your hands and allowing them to be rinsed. A simple but effective solution. At the time when the bunker was in operation, in addition to the normal rolls of toilet paper like the ones we have at home, there were packages of square toilet paper, pre-cut into pieces folded on top of each other. Since every inch is precious in the bunker, the square toilet paper allowed for storage in the lockers without wasting space. In an emergency, telecommunications are also important. A large and complex telephone switchboard with a disk dialer was connected to the outside world. Among the electronic equipment available to the bunker guests was a common calculator and several radio transmitters, countertop and portable. A large digital clock was installed in the main room so that the passage of time could be perceived even in the absence of sunlight. The facility had a variety of long-life food rations available. In addition to the common canned food, pickled food was also available. Imagine having to stay locked underground for three days, crammed in next to each other, with no view of a window and no way of getting out, accompanied by the incessant noise of the electric motor activating the ventilation system. Having to stay in the bunker for many hours, it was also necessary to have pastimes. To sweeten the atmosphere a little, a turntable in a case allowed one to listen to the vinyl records in the bunker. The decks of playing cards that were available to guests are still present. Along with a vast assortment of books, magazines and newspapers of the time were available for reading. Here is a book on the life of Lenin. In addition, the facility was equipped with a television set, which is currently available to watch some films of the time.
The waste from the bunker was taken to a special watertight section, communicating with a specially constructed storage pit. So the, my name is Albertus, I'm one of the founders of this bunker. Uh, we had an idea to save it, to protect it, because in Vilnius many such bunkers are already transformed into, let's say, nightclubs, uh, bowling clubs, uh, flats, uh, bars, whatever you can think about. And there were around 300 such bunkers in Vilnius during the Cold War. So Soviet Union was building them everywhere in every town because there was uh, huge competition between United States and USSR and everyone was really aware that the war can come any day. But of course, uh, for the most problems would be for civilian people. So these shelters were designed for civilians, not for military. And there were more than 300 of them. Uh, after the 90s, when Lithuania regained independence, most of them were uh, bought or sold by some other people because they were not in use anymore. And in 2019, uh, recently, a few years ago, we, uh, me and my colleagues, we decided to buy it because there was another uh, buyer of this shelter who wanted to make it uh, just as uh, basements for residents of lofts, so it could be gone, the all authenticity, and we decided to make it as a museum. We make our tours and people can experience how it was in the 70s or 80s in the late uh, Cold War. Era. Before saying goodbye, we test a restored and still working air raid siren for a couple of seconds. We saw what life might have been like in a Soviet fallout bunker during the Cold War. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you come to Lithuania, I invite you to visit Alberta's and see this bunker for yourself so that you can experience this testimony firsthand. If you have any questions about the bunker, the objects available, or if you need any clarification about visiting it, please do not hesitate to write a comment below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel to stay updated on future videos.